France, going down the Burt Flyway. It's not just here. Um, and um, for example, if you're coming down the Mediterranean, you want to think about an area in uh, Algeria, which is a subsea level where it can be flooded and turned into a giant uh, algae kind of a uh, fish farm or whatever. Uh, and uh, that would be, you have a kind of a flooding system and uh, you could do this by blasting waves in the terrain to open up the channels and that's all using Earth art vocabulary. And so you have these kind of rigs to grow uh, all the, just to collect all the, 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 the nutrients in the form of plants using sunlight. Um, it's just, um, now, again, is it art? I don't know. It is a, a form of energy production that uses sunlight through plants uh, in nature, in the outdoors, not in monoculture system, systems, uh, in conjunction with fish and so on. And uh, I think that this would be a, a, a long-term way of uh, handling the land as opposed to uh, any kind of, uh, <coughs> should we say, me a mega corporation uh, monoculture procedure. Okay, uh, or as opposed to giant solar uh, farms like this. Now, why do I include this image? This is, um, in the show, is the Center for Land Use Interpretation. Uh, I was invited by Center for Land Use Interpretation to go to this area, just indicated in this map. I mapped it up by basin, of course. And in the middle is a salt lake. It was all clogged up. And in that salt lake, I indicated some things you can do. Here's the site. It's all pretty desert-like. But um, in that site is the world's first really major solar energy system, and it completely does not work. Uh, what they forgot about is sandstorms. The sandstorms destroyed the panels of the solar energy system there in that desert area uh, to which I was invited by the Center for Land Use Interpretation. And uh, let's just say that that basin, which is uh, in near Barstow, California, the Harper Dry Lake Basin, is still an open question but how to develop it into an uh, so we say, ideal ecosystem or a closed ecosystem. And it could be a practice site for what I've indicated for, uh, to you about, say, uh, Afghanistan which again is a closed ecosystem. Okay, now, I don't know if you can read that, it says military architecture and earth art. And if you see the videotape in there, you'll see something about military architecture from the 80s. Um, the scale is huge. And earth art from say the 60s, but the scale is very small. Well, small for military, big for art. But very similar vocabularies. That is to say, when I would show a photograph, satellite photograph, of this channel in the, in the uh, Persian Gulf area, people will say, well, that looks like a Michael Heitzer. Well, no, it's not. It's actually 20 miles long. Michael Heitzer is maybe two miles long. But the parallels, I think, are very similar. And there's uh, quite a bit of writing, uh, for example, by Vincent Scully uh, at Yale about art and military technology, or earth art and military engineering. So this is not an idle comparison. The question is, can we think on a similar scale? And there's a scale which I show in the first go. You may have seen this before, some of you. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a context. In the Persian Gulf area, down by the Tigris Euphrates, um, there can be construction of giant channels uh, like this and like over here, which uh, would be fulfilling the work started by the Russians with Iraq and would probably be beneficial to the Gulf. And that's the kind of scale of the thing giant. This is uh, maybe uh, a 1,000 meters across. And that's the paradigm. That is a work by Dennis Oppenheim called uh, Dead for Rome. That's a work by the Russian engineers. Not much different, really. It's just a, a way of having fluted flows of water. You can see this on 56th Street and Madison Avenue in a piece by Michael Heitzer, where he does, does kind of a fluting system for the water, where some water goes through some channels and some doesn't go through and you can have variable volumes of water flow, and it's just a way of making sure the flow is rapid. Um, and I'm just su suggesting that art ideas can be taken seriously. They can get on big scale. They can become part of the way of engineering a whole river. And that would be a way of following through. Now, I have shown this, as you know, many times, and the implication is that for the Persian Gulf, it has not happened yet. Maybe it should, maybe it can that there could be a way of really restoring flows from the Tigris of Freeze down to the sea within the whole catchment. I learned this very well in the UAE. There's many problems down here with flows down to that coast. 
And, um, you know, I was meeting with scientists in the United Arab Emirates down here, and I was saying, what's the biggest issue here in the United Arab Emirates down by Dubai? He said, the biggest issue for them down here was this, Tigris and Brady's. What happens in Tigris and Euphrates, or more precisely, what happens in Turkey with the dams, directly impacts on them in, the, in Dubai. Well, fine. Let's have an overall catchment plan for the entire Tigris and Euphrates and Persian Gulf Basin, identified for the Persian Gulf as a unit, as a body of water. And I say this uh, with some personal impact, because I went, after meeting with scientists in Dubai, well, in the UAE, I should say, and saying, okay, we will model the entire Persian Gulf, we will look at the Tigris Euphrates, we will identify new ways of dealing with the Tigris Euphrates for a better flow into the sea, so a better circulation in the whole Persian Gulf. After I did that, I then did a project of cutting a channel, like we just saw the, the multi-channel canals, cutting a channel along the coast of uh, Ajman, Ajman, by Sarjan Ajman, into a subsea level area, into a kind of polar area, to cut a channel so the sea could get into the polar area. And as I did that, I was helped a lot by some uh, Pakistani workers. As I did that, I don't have pictures, I'm sorry, but as I did that cutting, I found that almost all the so-called sand I was cutting and digging and then using a machine was not sand at all. It was crushed shells, crushed seashells. There is an amazing amount of life in the Persian Gulf, such that by the time the nutrients get from the Tigris Euphrates to this coast and hit the coast, it's not sand, it's seashells. It's a whole new living system. And if you think about the temperature there, <coughs> 35 degrees, 40 degrees, you begin to see that, hey, this is fermentation. This is ongoing gas production. This is ongoing ferment. This is ongoing biological activity. And it's a very living system. It's not just a dead system by any means. It's, it's quite exciting to realize that you have a shell, not well, duck shell, but a shell, a seashell production uh, capacity in this body of water that impacts right on that coast. And you, one could have a comprehensive policy or practice. And what's funny is when the scientists told me this, you see, I was invited to be in Sarja, in the Sarja Biennial, and I said to do a thing about that area. And I had no idea what was going on. And I went to the scientists and I said, well, what's the biggest issue here? And they said, Tigris Euphrates. Wow. So let's think about the engineering of the Tigris Euphrates along the lines of what I showed before about the giant earthworks that open up the flow to the sea. Let's think about the fact that as the waters go through past Qatar and past um, uh, Saudi Arabia, that there is, in fact, some kind of living process happening. There is a conversion of nutrients into seashells. And maybe we have a really interesting biological system in the whole Gulf Basin as a unit. That would be, I think, a very interesting initiative by Holland to make, since Holland is with Shell Oil Company, how about a seashell campaign? Okay, and also how about kids collecting what's there? You know, right at the shore, this is in Ireland, but hey, you know, in Dubai, right at the shore, there's gobs and gobs of seagrass. They're not collecting it, they could, it could be local energy. Okay, now I'm right, uh, just showing this little brochure. Uh, this is from 1983. It's a seaweed wrap and farm design in the United States and China. And uh, 1983, they recommended from the New York Sea Grant Institute in uh, New York State, they recommended that about $10 million be spent on pretty much everything I'm talking to you about now. So they did local energy production, sea rigs, uh, water cycles, biological systems, I'm just a spokesperson for existing scientific thought. But of course they said we can't afford this, we can't really do this. Uh, it's better to have 9-11, you know, or better to have the oil industry stay in place. And that is the drama today. Well, one of my colleagues, the one in England, will be in Tsingtao in China in about a week to discuss with them how China and my company, Ocean Earth, whatever, can cooperate and get these things going so we don't have any more delays so that we can begin to restore the ecosystems and have the wild animals back in our midst. Um, that is not an idle picture because the, there's a quite famous book in America now called Water and Natural History. And 
and saying that we have a water crisis